Good morning, everybody. Yay. It's early, huh? I like I was late getting here because it was nine o'clock scheduled and I woke up at 845. <laughs> so, but I'm also from the West Coast, so I was a little bit behind. Um, but I am grateful to be here today. Um, thank you so much, Erica, for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to talk about my work and I'm gonna try to rush through because I know we're running behind. Um, so you can all go to your other sessions. Uh, I have a clicker. I don't have a clicker. Um, my name is Courtney Ziegler. I am head of research and design um, at Zam Labs. My talk today is finding purpose through the things that you build. Um, who am I? That's me. <laughs> I am a California native. Um, I live in Oakland, California. I am a dog dad. That's my amazing dog. She has saved my life. I don't know if any of you all are dog people, but if you're not and you're not allergic to dogs, I suggest you get one in your life. <laughs> They are amazing. Um, I was not a dog person, and I dated someone who had a dog, and it changed my life. Um, and my dog's name is Doe, Doe the Pup on Instagram. She's famous. <laughs> uh, I am a social inventor, a creative entrepreneur, um, a builder and maker for the past 23 years. I've gotten to kind of dabble in a lot of different spaces, the academic spaces, um, film, art, as well as um, entrepreneurship, which I'll talk a little bit about how I came to be an entrepreneur. Um, so what is Zam Labs? Zam Labs stands for Ziegler and Michael Labs, uh, my genius and brilliant um, co-founder. We've been working together for about five years now. Whew, time, jeez. <laughs> about five years now. Um, we met when she was working at Dev Bootcamp. She was on the founding team of Dev Bootcamp. Um, they eventually sold, and she was like, do you want to start a company with me? And I was like, sure, why not? I had just... Um, started a professor job at San Francisco State, which I was unemployed for a significant amount of time. Um, I outed myself yesterday, I'm trans, and so I like encountered a lot of anti-trans discrimination, um, and I had a PhD and a lot of you know, awesome work behind me, and I couldn't find a job, I couldn't um, keep my life sustainable, I was losing my home, I lost my car, was repossessed, everything sucked. <laughs> um, and so I was like, what do I do? So I had to kind of create a job for myself, um, and so I launched an organization called TransHack. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar in this room, uh, but yes, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, TransHack. Um, and it was launched in 2013 when I had, was literally had nothing, um, but I was living in Oakland at the time um, and participating in a lot of entrep tech entrepreneurial spaces uh, because it was kind of shifting into Oakland at that moment. Um, went to a film hackathon and I saw that it wasn't very inclusive, as I was a filmmaker, and it wasn't inclusive of people like me, and it was really focused on like the engineers who were like creating these apps. So I was like, man, it would be really cool if there was a space where actually I can go in and be included because I'm really smart and I have a lot of things to bring to the table. Um, and so that kind of led me to create TransHack. Um, wildly successful, ran for about three years, um, and then I eventually met my co-founder who was like, F that, let's start a company. She didn't say that, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but she was like, yes, she, she was like, trans hack changed my life, she's not trans. Um, sorry to out you, <laughs> I'm not trans. Um, but um, definitely, she said it was like kind of the first place for her in, in, in tech where she felt included. Um, and that was really life-changing for me to, and humbling to be able to create something where people who are not even trans identified can come and felt um, that they were part of the tech community, which I had just entered into. So that's how we came to, to work together. Um, we have two projects now that are kind of our most successful. One is Appalachian, which I talked about yesterday. Um, we also have been building a virtual conference software. It's uh, raised some VC money for that, so we're super proud and excited um, and have been building that for a couple of years. And we're having a conference next week. Hopefully you guys can attend, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, why this talk matters? Why does my talk matter? Um, well, for me personally, it matters because I'm constantly going through this kind of moment of what am I doing in this space? How am I finding my purpose? So I'm constantly every day myself asking, like, what is my goal? Um, what is driving me in this space? Um, and I think that we're always, all of us are constantly I'm going to project. I'm assuming that all of us are kind of like, why am I here? What am I doing? At least just as a human being, but definitely like in our professional working spaces, like what's our purpose? So what is purpose? Um, I define it as a force that drives us to create change 
to make change to exist. It's pretty lofty. That's pretty like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sounds pretty, pretty powerful, right? It's like why you do the things you do. Um, why are you here at this conference? What was your purpose for being here? My assumption is that you came to not only like build community um, and be a part of something, but hopefully, you know, take some like, you know, some tools and resources away, right? To hopefully make change. So our purpose is like really about like, and we kind of talk about this in not only like just our daily lives, but our professional settings about, you know, it's our why. And then going from that, it's like how, and then, then in the kind of places like we find our what, right? So all of those kind of components are always driving us like, how do we find the center of what we're doing? Um, and for me, I think uh, in addition to work, but just in life, I've had a kind of a few significant moments that have really set me on my life path of finding my purpose, um, which I'm kind of finding every day. Um, and I would probably say one of the first times, I'm gonna go through three moments that were really, really significant, or, or three, um, whoa, sorry. <laughs> uh, three things that are really significant in my life about finding my purpose. Um, as I mentioned, I am a California native. I grew up in, I'm an 80s baby, I'm an elder millennial, which means we hurt, but <laughs> you know we're still part of the cool generation. Um, I grew up in the 80s, went to Compton High. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with uh, 1980s Compton. Um, if you are, you're probably familiar with the stereotypes of 1980s Compton, <laughs> and so, and, uh, which, you know, we can talk about that in another talk. But so I come from that, like, you know, this generation of, in Los Angeles where black folks were, have, like my grandmother moved from the Midwest um, in the early 60s to LA, and then like in the 60s, the Watts riots happened, um, and then she moved from LA to Compton, which Compton used to be an all white suburb. I tell people that George Bush and I are from the same city, which we are, uh, born and raised, which is kind of weird. So Compton was like this really, white suburb of Los Angeles, um, experienced white flight once black folks started to move in. My grandmother was part of that generation. Um, and then from then on, the rest of my family have been from Compton from that point on. I bring all that up to say that that has really shifted me <laughs> and who I am because being witness to kind of like, as a child, seeing the social demographics change and not really kind of having the language that I, that I do now as a scholar, but kind of just being in, involved and seeing things happen and being aware of, of poverty um, in the 80s and, and Compton's like the 80s in lots of kind of cities, uh, we have like crack epidemic happen, happening. So we're seeing like folks who have the start of like mass incarceration happening. Um, and so all of that was kind of part of my world growing up uh, in 1980s Compton. Um, but it was also something that inspired me. There's a picture of a computer there because um, in high school was when I got my first uh, laptop, desktop. <laughs> I didn't have a laptop. It looked exactly like that. Um, my grandmother bought it for me, and again, I grew up poor, so my grandmother, if she was alive today, would still say that she was paying on that computer for me. So, <laughs> like, um, and I'm so grateful to my grandmother for having, for having bought a computer for me because um, we, it, we, I was part of a college program, like get kids to college thing, um, Upward Bound, I don't know if, if that still exists, Upward Bound, yeah, okay, oh, awesome. Um, and so it was the first time I touched a computer in my life. Um, and I think that's what's very interesting about early 80s babies is that we're kind of digital and analog. Um, and later 80s babies are, are, are even closer to 90s uh, or more uh, digital. Um, and so I kind of straddle that line, which is really cool. <laughs> um, so that was one of the first kind of like moments that helped me find my purpose was actually getting a, a computer. Um, changed my world. I was on Prodigy, I was on AOL, I was on CompuServe, um, getting the, you know, the, the AOL disk, like making the fake accounts. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, getting on the chat lines, ASL. So, <laughs> you guys remember that? Um, so yeah, so, so that was, so getting a computer was like super important. Um, my grandmother was a person in my life that really helped me to find my purpose um, and still does, even though she's no longer physically with us. Um, my grandmother was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, and she would always tell me, I'm from the show me state, you're gonna have to show me. Um, and that, and she would use that for everything, like if you're like, just saying, whatever, I got to do something. And she's like, I don't believe you have to show me. I'm from the show me state. 
okay, grandma, okay. <laughs> um, but like that saying is really, it, I took it to like mean so many things. Um, I think it's deeper than, and I think my grandma was a deep person. I'm not gonna take, take her deepness away from that. Um, but I think as I got older, I feel like it meant something more than just like, you have to prove it to me. It's basically, you have to tell your own story. Um, that's what I feel like she was kind of instilling in me. Um, that you always have to show people who you are um, because you can't just tell them. Because even if you tell people, they might not believe it, right? You have to like physically always tell your, show, show people. Um, and so I took it as like, I always have to tell my story. Um, I always have to tell people who I am. I do that a lot. I don't know if you know me or of my work. I am always telling my story, um, always talking about the things that I've done. I'm always like sharing, I'm like my own oral documentarian, oral historian. Um, my own self uh, auto ethnographer. I keep going with the terms. Like, that mean. <laughs> so all of these things, um, and I'm really grateful for that because uh, what I've learned, not only just like from being a scholar and, and being trained to cite people um, and like build upon research that has existed before me, um, but I've learned that if you do not tell your story, people will say that it didn't happen, um, especially as a black person, especially as a black person who lives in the body that I do um, and looks the way that I do, people will tell me that things that I did didn't happen. And so it's super important. And that's a, a tip that I want to give all of you to always tell your story, always show people who you are. Um, it matters. Um, another way that I was really kind of like finding my purpose was uh, creative space. So not only just uh, being, having access to the internet with my computer, having the support of my grandmother, but um, I'm an artist at heart, even though I haven't been very artistic in the past five years. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. I, when I was younger, I knew that I was gonna become, grow up and become a filmmaker. Um, that's, that was my plan, that's what I was gonna do. I was gonna go to UCLA or NYU. I did not get into either of those schools, <laughs> but I was gonna go there and like make movies um, and do that. I, I still made movies. Um, I did not get into UCLA. I went to UC Santa Cruz, um, which was a way better, um, education for me. I was part of their first film program. Um, they had started in 1999, and I was part of that first class, and uh, they had a film and digital media. I, I got a graduated film degree, so I eventually did graduate film degree, made some films in school, um, made uh, some films out of school, stayed in school, went to grad school, um, made one of my most well-known films, when I was completing my doctoral exams, it's called Still Black, A Portrait of Black Trans Men. Um, it was the first uh, documentary to focus on black trans men. It was the first long form documentary to focus on black trans people that ever existed. And it was made in 2006 I started. So it was like prior to this moment that we're in where trans is like part of the mainstream, um, which I kind of consider myself a prophet, and I don't use that like as, as a way that's like, oh, I think I'm so awesome, but I think that there are certain folks who use their art to kind of foresee conversations that are happening. And I felt like Still Black was kind of part of that, like really helped to usher in um, these conversations of what it is to document uh, black trans lives, um, and not only document them, but kind of present them to a larger um, audience in ways that we, can't, we aren't really seeing um, you can actually go to stillblackfilm.org, you can download it, you can purchase it. Uh, we are continue to be screened around the world. Um, it's turned 11 years old in October this year, which is amazing. Um, won, won multiple, multiple awards. Um, I think we just showed in India last month. It's like kind of a cult classic now. Um, and it's taught at universities across the world, which is really, really freaking cool. Um, really excited. So if you are wondering, where are the voices of black trans men? They exist <laughs> and we're there. Um, and Still Black is kind of like one of those pieces that is still, I think, um, in a moment where we still are kind of moving towards having the language to talk about trans um, that includes a number of other trans identities. That's uh, the still from right next to it is another short film of mine. I was, uh, that's obviously me pre-T. I was, uh, it's a painting I did of my grandmother. I'm also a painter. Um, I was working on an installation which I want to return to one day. It was about crying. I, I, I don't really cry that much anymore in my life. I, I feel like crying is so important in healing. 
Um, and I wanted to, I was working on a piece where I was just documenting people crying. And so they would come to, or I would meet them, or they'd come to where I was, and um, I would be like, prepare to cry, bring something that you're gonna cry about, you're gonna release. And I would just film them crying, and I'd make these short films. And I filmed about eight people, and then um, the financial downfall hit where I was like losing, all, like lost, everything was in my life was going haywire because I could not pay for anything. Um, and so I had to stop that. Um, and then kind of went to a long, long depression. But <laughs> um, seriously, but creativity was definitely, being a creative person um, and creating art was something that has really definitely kind of driven me towards my purpose. Um, I'm also a nerd. I love stuff. I'm a Sagittarius. I don't know how many Sagittarius, Sagittarii <laughs> are in the room. Like, I, I, re, I, I just want to know everything. Like, I want to consume all the time. Like, it's probably unhealthy. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it is. Um, but I love to research things. Knowledge is, like, so empowering to me. Um, this is a quote by one of my favorite researchers and one of the, I think, one of the most underappreciated researchers um, of our lifetime, Zorona Hurston. Uh, research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. Um, and of course, that brings us back to this idea of purpose. Um, so research for me, like, for, like, I wake up in the morning and I, which is, again, probably unhealthy, but I'm not a medical doctor, so <laughs> don't listen to my advice of what is healthy or not. Um, I wake up and, like, kind of just immediately want to research. I uh, want to know what's happening. want to know what's happening in the world. want to like, learn something new. Um, yeah, a little bit obsessive. So, But research is definitely something that has really allowed me to kind of figure out like why I'm here um, and why I do the things that I do. Um, and I love being a nerd. That is actually a photo of me on my graduation day um, from Northwestern University. I was their first graduate of their PhD. Yes. <laughs> um, which was great because it was a horrible time in school. It was fucking awful. And so like, it was nice to kind of have an escape. I don't know if any of you are in this room, um, have gone through higher ed or have pursued a graduate degree. Um, in a, and they are, I guess, such a non-traditional student, which is what I kind of labeled myself. Um, I was at a prestigious private school. It was the first time in my life that I was around uh, other black folks who had parents with PhDs and like MDs, and I was like, what is this? Because it, it was unfamiliar to me. It wasn't my world. I, don't, I didn't grow up around that. Um, I, I'm the first one in my college, in my family had, that has gone to college and that actually has um, a doctorate. So like everybody in my family has looked to me to be like, you know, the one. Um, and so being in an environment where it's around other black folks and um, it, was a it was a class difference and it was a, a, a lot of differences um, in ideology and the ways that we were raised and the ways we thought. Um, I had a really difficult time, um, but it also helped me to like want to hurry up and finish. Um, and so we went in in 2006. There were five of us that they brought their, their first cohort, um, and I was their first graduate. And then about four years later, another person finished the program, So, which was really cool that I was the only person that had that degree in the world. Um, now I think there's four of us have graduated from Northwestern. Um, and being in that program was really difficult, so I leveraged the internet again, going back to finding my purpose with the internet. I had a really popular blog, Blackademic. Um, every time I mention Blackademic somewhere, someone always goes, I remember that. I was in London two weeks ago, and I mentioned Blackademic, and this person who was at least 15 years older than me and um, never met, he was like, I used to read your blog, and that's how like, I met uh, some, someone else, uh, this other person who's really, uh, online, does a lot of work online, um, and they were just like, this is how I met this person, this is how I met this, I'm so grateful for it, and I was like, whoa, I was like 24 years old, like, I think this says 26, is at the end of Black Academic, but I started when I was like 23 or 24, um, because I felt ostracized in my PhD program, and like, that I needed to like, and the ideas that I was creating weren't being supported, and so the online world really supported me. All my friends are online still, and I was able to grow Black Academic. Um, it went on to become a multiple award-winning blog. Um, that was during the time when uh, pre-Twitter, when blog blogging was like the shit. Um, and so, yeah, Black Academic. Um, 
How am I on time? I have two minutes. Oh, one minute. Okay. Um, my last thing. Um, I'm just gonna breeze through. My last thing is that uh, I found my purpose in tech. Um, I'm just going to read this. This is a quote by me. Um, again, it's important to document yourself because people will say you didn't do it. Um, in an industry rife with racially exclusionary practices, I remain convinced that it is on the fringes, the sites that others refuse to touch, that I am able to thrive. Um, that was an essay that I wrote about a few months ago about my experience as a black person, a black trans person in a tech space and the difficulties that I experienced. Um, and that in some ways, though, it may be a hard space for a person like me to exist in. Um, it's also a space that, that I like have adopted living in the margins um, and the, the freedom that allows me to. Um, and so that's where that quote comes from. Um, that's me. I found a trans hack. I mentioned that. That was our first. Uh, no, that was our second trans hack. No, that was our third. Track. That's where I met Tiffany in Chicago. That's trans hack Chicago. Um, the one in the top right was the first one. Um, and that was our first guest, which was Janet Mock. And she was like, why would I be at a tech event? But that, at the time, she had a Girls Like Us hashtag on Twitter. And it was being used to kind of like really, uh, so other trans women can find each other. Um, and I was like, that's a, a, a important use of tech. Can you be our uh, keynote speaker to trans hack? Um, and also people were impressed because it's Janet Mock. <laughs> and they're like, wow. And all the tech people were like, oh my God. Um, and so it was really awesome to create TransHack because I wasn't in tech at the time. So I think I made it a great experience because I had nothing to compare it to other than the awful experience I had at some other hackathon. Um, and so we had about 45 people come. We made actual working apps. Um, some of them are still working today. Um, bathroom apps, Refuge Restrooms is one, um, that Yelp actually stole. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, yeah, Yelp kind of took, uh, that's a long story. Yelp, Yelp steals. <laughs> I'm sorry if anybody works at Yelp in here, but major companies do. Um, and Appalachian um, launched November 7th, 2017. It was from a tweet of seeing the work of uh, Southern Group, uh, song and national bailout. Um, they were doing a black women's bailout. And I saw these black women raise over a million dollars or something um, knocking on doors, grassroots. And I was like, if they could do that, like I didn't see crowdfunding, crowdfunding in that way. I was like, if they could do that, what can we do with technology? Um, and so seeing the kind of like spare model, the spare change model being used by investment apps, um, banking apps. And I was like, it's great that you can save your spare change to invest. Um, it would be great if you can save your spare change to bail people out. I sent a tweet, and I was like, would people support that? And people were like, hell yeah, we'll support that. We'll sign up. And so I was like, oh, word. Um, OK. <laughs> so we went to figure out how we can get it up as the quickest way possible. About three months after that, um, we had about 5,000 people sign up on Appalachian. And we were hoping we'd have 200. Um, and by the start of 2018? Yeah, we had about 8,000 signups. Um, the point is we've generated uh, about almost $400,000 in spare change alone um, to get people out of jail. We bailed out over 120 people. Um, this is a little bit, the slide is a little bit old. It's been longer than five months. Um, within our second month of operation, we won two awards. We are number seven, the top 10 most innovative companies um, listed along, among giants. And it was just like, we were just like, let's just start this to see if, it, if people will sign up. Um, and it's done so much good <laughs> that uh, we're super impressed and honored and humbled to, to be behind it. Um, but yeah, it's given me a different kind of purpose um, in a really humbling way. Um, do you guys remember this meme? I'm going to show you. No? OK. <laughs> I discovered things you are going to go through this. Uh, this is a funny meme. I love it. I love memes. Um, so, you know, when we're always thinking about finding purpose, I hope you take away from this talk is that you provide value. All of us never let anybody tell you any different, no matter if you're in a hackathon with engineers who don't want to listen to your ideas, um, you still provide value. Um, and don't, yeah, you provide value. That's it. Find your community. Um, your team is important. I think that that's just basic in life, in any situation you are. Um, find your friends so you don't die. Seriously. Um, remain open to growth. I um, 
though sometimes I err on the side, the Sagittarius in me thinks I know everything. I actually don't. I don't. I know nothing. Um, and I'm always open to like growing more. I'm always asking people for help and input, um, their opinion, um, things that I don't know about. Tell your story. Because again, they're gonna tell you that it didn't happen. I'm living proof that they will tell you that it didn't happen. So always tell your story, always document what you're doing. Feel no shame in stunting all the time. Because if you don't, like you have to like up, your, big up yourself all the time. Um, and I think in the tech space is a very interesting space because I, again, I come from an academic background where I'm trained to cite people. I'm trained to build up on research. I'm trained to like look and see, put pieces together. Whereas in tech, it's not necessarily the same space. Um, people aren't really told to, it doesn't function in the same ways. And so I think you have to do a little bit more work in this space to, to document yourself. So always do. Um, I tweet a lot <laughs> telling my story um, and I have no shame. Um, help others, always extend yourself, um, especially in this space and not necessarily physically helping others like things, but just like whether that's like being checking in on each, each other, sending an email, um, sending a DM, um, congratulating folks, just seeing where they are, that's super important. Um, it will help you. And you, again, you guys are smart people. This isn't anything that I'm not magical knowledge, um, but just basic how to be a good person. I do have some asks before I go away. Uh, Acquisition has been really successful, but we need some money. <laughs> um, we need some money, and so if you want to support us, you can sign up and create an account. Um, we're also crowdfunding by using Appalachian, um, hopefully trying to raise $100,000. Um, I know some of you all work at amazing companies who might want to help support that, so please come talk to me. Um, follow me on Twitter. There's me, Fake Rapper. There's a story behind that name, really quick story, because everybody asks. Um, when I was writing my dissertation in a coffee shop in Oakland, um, I was handwriting because I used to handwrite things. Um, and this white woman came up to me and she was like, oh, are you writing rap lyrics? No offense to rappers, love them, but the, with the assumption that like, of course, that that had to be the thing that I was writing. And so that became my Twitter name because I thought it was so funny <laughs> um, that like a lot of people thought I was a rapper. And so uh, that's the story behind Fake Rapper. Follow me on Twitter. I'm really grateful to be here today. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I didn't rush that badly. <laughs>